Hi, I'm Jared Gardner. I'm here today with my dermatopathology fellow, Dr. Ed Fulton, and uh, Ed requested that we uh, cover a really rare and interesting entity, which is near and dear to my heart today. It's uh, called primary cutaneous pecoma. Pecoma stands for perivascular epithelioid cell, and it's a kind of strange name because there is no such thing actually as a perivascular epithelioid cell. So these uh, tumors were first described um, in, internally, and they occur in several different sites in the human body, and um, are, are kind of considered as a family of tumors because they have some similarities, but they also have some differences depending on the different subtype. And the cutaneous pecomas seem to be quite different from the internal ones, okay? So let's uh, talk about what we're seeing here. First, we have a shave biopsy. I'll show you from low power. You can see this is a shave of a nodular dermal lesion. And um, I also got to see the re-excision of this case at the bottom. It was relatively circumscribed in this particular case. Um, and this is a lesion that's filling the dermis, and you can tell that it's made of very pale or clear cells. It has a very pale look from low power. And you can see little pink uh, wisps of uh, leftover collagen from the reticular dermal collagen, as well as uh, a delicate network of vessels in the background. All right. Let's look closer at the histologic features here. Cutaneous pecomas, uh, I've seen about, I think, six of them now. And uh, we published actually a series of five of them uh, just uh, last year in the Journal of Cutaneous Pathology. I'll put a link to our paper um, down below if you're curious to see uh, what our cases look like. But all of the, essentially all of the cutaneous pecomas I've seen look just like this. They are made of uh, clear or very pale cells that have a lot of uh, pale cytoplasm. And it usually has this kind of uh, vacuolated, uh, like kind of washed out vacuolated look, but not like the sharp vacuoles of say sebacites or lipoblasts and not the fine vacuoles of xanthoma. They don't look like that. They just have this kind of very clear uh, falling apart looking cytoplasm. And then in the midst of that cytoplasm, they have a little bit of pink granular um, material, uh, kind of a granular pink cytoplasm too. And uh, the, uh, the finding of clear cells and then areas of kind of granular pink material in the cytoplasm is really helpful, I think, for recognizing uh, pecomas. And they're arranged in these kind of packets or almost nest-like structures and also like kind of trabeculae that, that merge in between, uh, they kind of uh, fill the spaces in between the background dermal collagen bundles, okay? You can see they're kind of running in these kind of like vague rows and they make these little little packets here or little uh, clusters and then the clusters all are put together to make a sheet. It's hard to describe, but once you've seen a few of them, they have a very distinct look. And uh, the, the nuclei of these cells are oval to round. Let's see if we can get them in good focus here. Oval to round and they usually have relatively fine chromatin and they may have one or more small nucleoli. I think most of the cases I've seen did have small nucleoli in them. And mitoses can be present, but they're usually infrequent, um, usually less than one per 10 uh, high power fields. And occasionally you can see scattered larger cells, but you shouldn't be seeing severe cytologic atypia in these, okay? So in uh, PCOMA is a really large topic. We're gonna just really focus on the cutaneous ones today because they think they have a distinct look and they're kind of of interest to dermatopathologists. But the, uh, the whole PCOMA family, there's been an awful lot written about this topic and it's really a lot to cover in one short video. Again here, you can see the kind of vacuolated clear cytoplasm that it, you know, if you weren't thinking, if you weren't looking carefully at it, it might at first give you the impression of vacuolated lipoblasts. Like there you can see kind of kind of some vacuoles. One helpful thing is that in lipoblasts or say sebacites, things that have actual lipid, they and also xanthoma cells, they often, the, the bubbles are clear and perfectly round and they usually indent the nucleus. Um, and you don't really see that um, to any significant degree with pecomas. Okay, and I think one of the thoughts is that the clear, um, the clear change in the, these may at least in part be due to glycogen. I'm not sure if that's fully known, but uh, they do sometimes have glycogen in them. And they do not involve the epidermis, okay? By definition, as far as I understand, I've never seen a case or heard of a case involving the epidermis that I can recall. And uh, they're a, a dermally based tumor, and I guess they, they leave this background uh, reticular collagen bundles and kind of fill up all the space in between. All right, so now down to immunostaining. The reason that pecomas are so interesting is they have such an unusual pattern on immunohistochemistry. And this is true essentially for all the pecomas in the body. They have the co-expression of melanocytic markers like HMB45 and uh, MART1, which is also known as melan A. 
And then they also co-express muscle markers either actin, smooth muscle actin, and or desmin. And those can be present in a varying degree, in, in varying proportions in, in different picomas. But usually they have the co-expression of those things, at least one of the melanocytic markers and usually at least one of the muscle markers, okay? And so that very unusual, um, the very unique histologic appearance plus that unusual immunophenotype can help you make the diagnosis. Now let's talk a bit about the differential diagnosis and we'll talk about some other stains um, in that context. Let's go closer so while well, I'm talking you can admire these pretty clear cells all right so for one thing in the skin when you see clear cell things I already mentioned that you might think of evacuated things like lipoblasts or you might think of sebocytes you might think of xanthoma cells or other pale histiocytic processes um, just on the H&E &E. and you also might think of balloon cell change in a melanocytic lesion and that makes sense you've got oval round nuclei you have kind of a packeted or nested appearance in the way the cells are growing and balloon cell change in a nevus or balloon cell change in a melanoma is when you get abundant, pale, kind of frothy cytoplasm in melanocytes. The one thing I'll say is that even though balloon cell change occasionally can be really extensive, almost always there's going to be some background part of the, the lesion that looks like a normal nevus or like a conventional melanoma. So I think I don't think I've ever seen a case where the entire lesion was completely balloon cell. I'm sure it happens, but it's extremely rare if it does. And the other big thing is that in addition to HMB45 and MART1 or melan-A, in melanocytic things, you're essentially always, with very rare exceptions, going to have expression, strong, diffuse expression of S100 protein and SOX10. And S100 protein is an interesting thing. It has been described in, in visceral internal picomas in almost a third of cases can have S100 expression. In the skin, if you see S100 expression and HMB and uh, melan-A or MART1, you have to exclude melanocytic before you ever consider making a diagnosis of picoma. Remember, melanocytic things are very common in the skin. Picomas are extremely rare. I think there may be about 30 cases of cutaneous picoma reported so far, um, somewhere around that number. Extremely rare. So you have to be sure um, if you do S100 and it's negative, then you're pretty good. It's very unlikely to be melanocytic with the exception of some very nasty um, uh, de-differentiated looking melanomas that sometimes lose um, uh, S100 protein. But uh, here again, this looks cytologically benign. All right. And so the other thing you can do is, is um, oh, I'm sorry, in the skin, the Philobois group from UCSF, they did a, um, a nice paper on cutaneous picomas and they found uh, a subset of cases, I think around 10 percent had some S100 staining, but the S100 was cytoplasmic and it was relatively weaker than the normal control. And they found that with doing a diastase digestion to remove glycogen, that the S100 staining went away actually in, in a significant portion of those cases. So they wondered if maybe the S100 is a non-specific staining of glycogen, at least in some cases. But the big thing is that usually it's going to be weaker. And the other thing is usually essentially always, as far as I know, SOX10 is negative in picomas. Um, if there's a paper out there describing that, I may have overlooked it, but all the PCOMAs that we've tested were SOX10 negative, and especially the cutaneous ones. So, so that's the nice thing. If you see any S100, do the SOX10, and SOX10 negativity, again, is going to strongly argue against a melanocytic lesion, okay? Melanocytic lesions can, uh, particularly melanomas, can express desmin, so do keep that in mind that desmin can be seen in, um, in melanocytic things, in PCOMAs, in uh, muscle tumors, all of that. All right. So that's a cutaneous picoma. Again, it's got a very distinct appearance. It's got a unique immunophenotype. Um, a couple other points to make. Some, a subset of internal visceral picomas have TFE3 gene translocations or gene fusions, and those have not yet been found in the cutaneous picomas. The other thing is that near the kidney, the most common type of picoma is angiomyolipoma, AML, uh, a, a tumor that uh, occurs near the kidney and is um, relatively a lot more frequent than cutaneous picomas. So that pattern of a angiomyolipoma is a picoma, stains like picoma, but it has areas that look like smooth muscle, areas that look like um, mature fat, and then it has a prominent vasculature uh, to it, okay? And uh, those tumors have that, that type of picoma, has that look essentially only in near the kidney or the retroperitoneum or maybe elsewhere in the peritoneal cavity. I've never seen that appearance in a cutaneous picoma. And in the 1990s, there were some papers published about angiomyolipoma of the skin. And in retrospect, what those actually were was not at all a picoma. They were actually angioliomyomas, vascular type lyomyomas, which are nodules that occur down in the subcutis, often in the legs. And they, a lot of times those angioliomyomas, vascular lyomyomas will incorporate mature fat. And I 
I published a, a paper about this with one of my medical students a couple years ago, and I'll put that uh, uh, in the, the uh, video description down below so you can read the, the papers I've mentioned here um, in this video. So anyway, if you see something that you think looks like muscle and fat and vessels, it is all, and it's in the skin or the subcutis or the soft tissue of the extremity, the chance of it actually being a true pecoma is as close to zero, okay? I've never seen one with that angio uh, myolipoma phenotype, the, the, the perirenal tumors essentially only occur near the kidney and in the retroperitoneum, okay? So make sure that you don't make that mistake. And uh, these uh, these tumors have an, another interesting thing. They usually occur on the lower legs. And in, in the cases I've seen, they seem to be predominantly in women, but they can occur in men also. But the lower le the legs, either the thigh or the lower leg, um, is the most common site to see cutaneous pecomas in our experience. Okay, so again, let's go back to low power so you can just see that look of just pale sheets of cells filling, um, filling the dermis. And that's a cutaneous uh, pecoma. All right, and also some internal pecomas uh, have associations with tuberous sclerosis. That has not, that link has not been found for cutaneous pecomas. Some of the visceral ones, again, like I said, even though we think of these as one type of tumor because they all have the overlapping staining of muscle and, um, and melanocytic markers, it seems to be different subtypes have some different um, things about them. Now this one's relatively pale, but I'm gonna show you because I, uh, you can see how deep it goes. Look up here, in the, um, and then we're going to show you some stains and talk about the differential a little bit more. Let's see if I can get the light right here. Here's a pecoma that's not quite as diffusely filling the dermis. It really leaves a lot more of that reticular collagen in the background, and here with the condenser you can see that. This is normal dermal collagen, and the tumor is just kind of oozing in between all the collagen. It's not making um, a desmoplastic response. The body is not reacting to it with a lot of inflammation or a lot of fibrosis. And that seems to be um, the case for most of these that I've seen, as they just kind of sit here in the dermis, right in between the collagen bundles, and seem the body seems perfectly happy with um, sharing its space with the, the tumor. And then here are the cells. Again, they've got... Uh, really dramatic uh, clearing of the cytoplasm, round to oval nuclei, kind of again arranged in these kind of vague nests or trabecular kind of rows in between that um, in between that reticular dermal collagen. Again, look at the pale chromatin and the kind of punctate nucleoli in the center of the nucleus. Okay, so when we see a clear cell thing with uniform cells and nucleoli, one thing we could think of is clear cell sarcoma, which occurs in the distal extremities, usually of young adults. It's malignant and it, it stains just like a melanoma, and, uh, but it does not usually involve the epidermis. It's a deep, a deep nodule, sometimes can come up into the dermis. Usually clear cell sarcoma, it will have uh, this kind of cytoplasm and it, it has prominent nucleoli, but they're usually much larger than this. And, and even though as a translocation sarcoma, they don't usually have a lot of pleomorphism uh, like some melanomas do, they usually have enough mitotic activity that it doesn't take long to tell that they're clearly a malignant tumor that you're dealing with. But if you had any doubt here about clear cell sarcoma, the easiest thing to do is do S100 and SOX10 because um, clear cell sarcoma will stain with MART1 and with HMB just like a pecoma, but it's gonna always, essentially always express strong S100 and SOX10. And like we said, S100 is usually only weak if it's positive at all in the cutaneous pecoma and SOX10 is dead negative. The other thing to think of when you see clear cells filling the dermis is metastatic renal cell carcinoma. And that's a really important differential to keep in mind because renal cell carcinomas uh, stain with CD10 and guess what else stains with CD10? Cutaneous pecomas. Essentially all of the cases I think that we've tested and other, other people have published reports also of CD10 staining strong and diffuse in cutaneous pecomas. I personally do not like to use CD10 for any spindle cell or mesenchymal tumor. Um, uh, in heme path it might have a role, but in, in uh, soft tissue pathology and the rest of derm path I essentially never use it because it's so nonspecific. And it will really get you in trouble if you're thinking of renal cell and you do a CD10 and say, oh well it's positive. CD10 was pur purported to be a good marker for atypical fibrosanthoma, AFX at one point, but I, again, I see it stain routinely um, uh, pecomas, I've seen it stain melanomas, angiosarcomas, spindled squames, so many different things that I just feel like it's not, it's not helpful. It's almost as bad as Vimentin, and I totally hate Vimentin. That's an absolutely worthless stain that should not be used at all in modern soft tissue pathology, totally nonspecific. All right.
So uh, again, clear cell sarcoma, easy to rule out by S100 and SOX10, just like ruling out melanoma, balloon cell melanoma, or balloon cell nevus. Let's look at some of the stains here. Here's an example. This is the, the case we were just looking at. And here is the stain for HMB45. And it's really nice granular staining in the cytoplasm. Sometimes these stains are relatively diffuse. Sometimes they're patchy. Sometimes they can be very focal. Okay, so HMB45 expression very nicely seen in this cutaneous picoma. And then let me show you the MART1, the other melanocytic stain. HMB seems to stain uh, more often than MART1. Now look, this looks negative, but actually when I looked around, let's see if I can find the area, it's very subtle, but there is actually very focal granular staining that in any other setting I might have even disregarded. But here I think it is real in this context. It's granular and it's right in the cytoplasm of the tumor cells, okay? So HMB and MART expression. And then here is a Desmond stain. And again, look in the middle, there's very little staining, but at the edges, much stronger staining. And here's some smooth muscle from the erector pili as a normal control. But you can see in the background, that's the erector pili muscle. And then um, in the background here, you can see the clear cells. You can see them because of their large, uh, or their uh, punctate nucleoli in the middle. And you can see they're nicely staining with Desmond. And uh, the S100 stain um, and SOX10 on this case are negative. Also look that CD68 uh, tends to be positive in these, just like CD10 and CD68s are relatively, oops, sorry, I've got a, something on the back of the slide there. CD68 um, is um, relatively nonspecific in the setting of neoplasms in soft tissue. So out, uh, again, in heme path, it can be useful. In inflammatory derm path, I use CD68 sometimes, but I rarely ever use it. This case was uh, something that I had seen uh, from consultation a long time ago. And so here's six, CD68 diffusely positive here. So again, you could, if you see CD68, does not mean that it is histiocytic. CD68 stains uh, lysosomes, the lysosome organelle, any uh, any um, cell that has lysosomes will potentially stain with CD68. So real important to, to not overinterpret that as a sensitive marker of histiocytes, but not at all specific. And if you were thinking this might be a xanthoma or something, this could really get you in trouble by seeing the CD68 here. All right, so this again, the co-expression of HMV and MART, and then also Desmond in this case, helped confirm the diagnosis. One thing that's important to, to point out before we close, oh, and here is a Here's CD34, and why I'm showing this is, well, for one thing, it looks brown. Not everything that's brown is positive on immunostains. Knowing the pattern is really important. Look right here, you can see if you go to higher power, tumor cells are dead negative. What's happening is all the compressed little vessels in between the tumor cells are staining, and also the compressed portions of dermis, which have different spindle dendritic cells that routinely stain with CD34. Look out here to the side. CD34 normally stains the dermis quite intensely. And um, I have a video on normal skin and immunohistochemistry. I'll put a link up in the upper right hand corner. You can go watch that and see uh, some more discussion of immunostains in the skin. So see this background dermis plus little fine uh, vascular network is getting entrapped between the, the nest and trabeculae. But you, I like this stain because it really points out, look how nested this actually is. It's hard to see because they kind of make a syncytium on the H&E, but these really are these kind of little clusters and groups and nests and also some that are longer um, trabecular structures like here. So the CD34, make sure you don't call this pattern positive. This is actually negative, but it really highlights the growth pattern of the tumor. And this particular case actually um, kind of infiltrated and trickled down into the subcutis at the bottom here, and that's okay. I've seen that happen a few times. Because these are so rare, um, essentially almost all of the cutaneous PCOMAs reported have behaved in a benign, indolent fashion. There have been, I think, two reports of malignant ones. And if you see a lot of mitotic activity, a marked cytologic atypia, or other you know, necrosis, other features of malignancy, that's when you gotta be really careful. And you might wanna get an expert consult then because um, only two cases reported. I'm always a little nervous about diagnosing something that's only been ever reported twice in the literature. So, um, but as far as we know, the follow-up on the vast majority of the small group of cutaneous PCOMAs reported has been very good and indolent, but because they're so rare, I think that uh, a complete uh, but simple excision, conservative excision to remove the tumor is a good idea. And the last point to make is that um, even though the classic staining is with, um, with uh, muscle markers and um, melanocytic markers in cutaneous picomas, uh, only about half of the cases will actually have muscle markers. So if you have uh, a tumor that looks like this, stains with MART1 or HMB45, is negative for S100 and SOX10, negative for SOX10, and it doesn't have any muscle marker, 
in that setting, it still would be fine to be a cutaneous P. coma. Just always make sure that you've ruled out melanocytic things and other entities in the differential before making this very rare diagnosis. So remember, in the skin, about half of cases will lack muscle marker expression, unlike their deep counterparts. Uh, thanks for watching. Please uh, click like if you enjoyed the video and subscribe to my channel and leave me comments or questions down below.